The next part of the afternoon is uh, being done by uh, Peter Lang. Uh, <laughs> uh, Alice Hawkins was uh, uh, Peter's great grandmother, and she did some really, really important work. And uh, I've been waiting for this, so I will sit down and enjoy. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Well, thanks for inviting me along today, Alex. If this was a free event, I think it would be pretty well attended, don't you? Yeah. 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 We've got three times the average, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say a special thanks to Mary, who uh, agreed to help out at just a day or two's notice, and Mary will be reading out certain writings of the day. Uh, Alex put a general email out to... Uh, Know what you described like the meetup was it called? Meetup is brilliant, yeah. yeah. Uh, asking for a, a lady to help out, help me out. Probably somebody rather like suffragettes, rather. Strong willed. All good to a point. <laughs> and uh, Mary came straight back and said that was a bit, so thank you very much. Yeah. So I'm here today to speak to you about the life of my great grandmother, Alice Hawkins, something whom I'm very proud of, I have to say that. She campaigned throughout her life for women's rights not only within the suffragette movement, and I'll mention that this afternoon. I've known about Alice from when I was a young boy. My grandfather, one of Alice's six sons, would often talk to me when I'd go around in school holidays when I was a seven or eight year old boy, and he'd tell me about his, grand, uh, his mother Alice. He actually went on some of the suffragette martyrs himself in, the, in our hometown of Leicester. I was a young boy then, I really didn't put a lot of store by it, to be quite frank, but to think back now, they are first-hand accounts of women's history in the making. My mum remembers her Granny Alice. Alice went to live with my grandfather when her husband died, so my mum lived with Alice for about 10 years, and she would tell me stories as well about, as I say, her Granny Alice. And we're very lucky. We perhaps want to have one of the best collections in the UK today of suffragette memorabilia that's still in the hands of the descendants of those valiant women. We've got Alice's sash, her hunger strike medal, her prison notes, numerous postcards, letters from the Pankhurst sisters. It is truly a tremendous collection. And um, I've got a few handouts for you at the end of the meeting and a website to go with it, which is purely for students. It's a free to use educational resource. So, what's, what brought me to, to speak about Alice's life? Well, I've always found it to be an engaging story. You know, it, she was a working woman, a shoe machinist by trade living in poverty, but she held her head up high, and she stood up for what she believed in. And I've always found it to be a tremendous story. But about six or seven years ago, I was asked by chance to speak at the local townswomen school. Uh, this lady heard about my, uh, my background, my heritage, and she asked me if I'd speak, and I'd never spoken publicly before, and I turned her down. But I think she was next headmistress, she was quite a strong good woman. She said, no, you are going to come along, you are going to do this. And it spurred me into this tremendous and passionate hobby that I have now. So, without further ado, let's talk about Alice, and I should be finished at 3 o'clock and take questions. The first, and all of the images you see today, will be from Alice's own collection of memorabilia. All of the images, every single one. This is a rather grainy photograph that we have of Alice and her five sisters, taken about 1901-1902 in a park in Leicester. There's Alice, at the top there, Selina, Polly, Emma, Harriet and Jane. And as I always say, ladies and gentlemen, for working class women working on limited incomes, aren't they finely dressed <laughs> in their Sunday dress? Put us all to shame. But who was Alice? Well, Alice was actually born in Stafford in 1863 into a very poor working class family. She was one of nine children. There were three boys as well as the six girls. Henry, her father, was a journeyman shoemaker by trade. And sometime in the 1870s, he travelled from Stafford to Leicester to find work. Because in Leicester, during those times, the shoe industry was on the up and up. Shoemaking, shoe machinery manufacture was on the up and up. He found work, brought the family down, and that's where Alice was to live and work for the rest of her life. And that's why I'm actually Leicester born and bred myself. 
And as you can see, Alice left school at the tender age of 13 to work in the shoe factories of the town for a very limited education. Shoemaking tends to run in my family blood. Alice was a shoe machinist. My mother was a shoe machinist. My father worked for a shoe, -making, shoe machinery manufacturer company called the British United that made all the shoe machines throughout the land, all the shoe factories throughout the country would have the BU machines that were called. And after that, I used to sit down with my mum and speak to her about Alice. And mum worked in what she called the boots and shoes. And so did her granny, Alice. In the mid-1880s, Alice went to work for a shoe factory called the Equity Shoes. It was to be a key strength in Alice's political life. It was one of the very first early workers' cooperatives in the country. So it had a very liberal view to their workforce. And it allowed Alice, it allowed Alice to take time off for her political campaigning. Because even though from a young age, no more than 20, Alice was a strong trade unionist. She campaigned throughout her working life to improve the pay and conditions of women in the shoemaking industry. So the equity shoes was to be a key strength in Alice's life. Her husband Alfred was to be the second key strength. They were like-minded socialists. Socialism ran through their very veins. And if the equity shoes were to be a key strength, Alfred was as well. He not only supported Alice in her trade union activities, he also supported Alice as a suffragette later in life. I'll talk about Alfred later. But as we come into the early 1900s, Alice is becoming disillusioned with what she could achieve in her political life. Because she realised that without the right to vote, women in society were being treated as second class citizens. And what did that mean for Alice? It meant that female shoe trade workers earned probably one third of what the men were earning for similar skills. And Alice realised that without the vote, women could not become empowered in society to correct those changes, those, those impurities in our society. Even within the shoe trade union, many of the men um, disagreed with the women's point of view. Many men believed a woman's place was in the home and not in a shoe factory taking a job that a man could be doing. Now, it's a rather complex story, complex thing, because it's not just about uh, male chauvinism. Extreme unemployment and extreme poverty meant that perhaps if a man had a job and he'd bring in 30 shillings a week, that would be better than a woman earning 10 shillings a week. Now, I don't profess to argue that case, but you have to understand it wasn't simply about men and women and male dominance. It was more to it than that. It was more about poverty, taking home a living wage. But nevertheless, Alice was becoming disillusioned with what she could achieve in her political life. She'd been a member of the Labour Party since 1894, just two years after it formed by Keir Harding. And even within the Labour Party, they were fairly ambivalent to the issue of women and the vote. But change came for Alice early in 1907 when three suffragettes came up to Leicester to hold a public meeting. Annie Kenny, <coughs> Helen Billington Craig, and another national leader spoke at the Shoe Trade Hall in Leicester. Alice had gone to the meeting and was quite taken by what she heard. So just a few weeks later, in February 1907, Alice went down to Hyde Park where the suffragettes had convened a meeting. And she wasn't a suffragette at this point, but she'd gone to the meeting. 300 women met at Hyde Park. It was the day of the state opening of the Parliament. And the women were hoping to hear of news in the King's speech of a bill to go through Parliament that term that would finally give women the right to vote. By the early afternoon, it was evident there was no news in the King's speech that day of such a bill. So the angry women, 300 of them, Alice included, marched down into Parliament Square and they protested outside the gates of the House of Parliament. <coughs> the police on the gates, fearing the women were trying to break into Parliament, called in the mounted police. And a battle ensued that afternoon in Parliament Square. By the end of the afternoon, Alice and 28 other women had been arrested taken off the Camero police station, put in the cells, waiting to be charged. That night, Alice wrote to her local MP in West Leicester and complained that the mounted police had charged the women down like Cossacks. She said no other civilised country would deal, deal with its women folk in such a manner. They cavalry charged the women. Well, the next day, the Westminster Police Court, now I'm going on too quickly, let's just stop at that point. 
Here we have perhaps the first piece of memorabilia to show you today in the family. Alison arrest warrant. It's actually a bail warrant. Issued that night at Kenner Road Police Station. So she's now been released on bail. Take notice that you, Mrs. Alice Hawkins, are bound over in the sum of two pounds to appear at the Westminster Police Court, situated at Rochester Road, at 10 a.m. the 14th day of February 1907, to answer the charge of disorderly conduct and resisting police. Signed by Mr. R. Fisher, officer on duty. Alice pasted that into an old fire register, which I am now a custodian of. Custodian of. Well, the next day, the Westminster Police Court, Alice and the other 28 other women were given, well, actually, to be fair, they were given the choice. It was called the option. 14 days in Holloway Jail or pay attention and fine. As was suffragette policy, the women refused to pay the fine. They would go to prison for their beliefs. So Alice, this working class lady from Leicester, this socialist through and through, found herself going off in the Black Mariah police vans to Holloway Jail with women from all, from all social backgrounds and all political persuasions. Both women were united as one in the fight to gain the right to vote. Whilst in Holloway Jail on that first occasion, Alice wrote about 800 words, and this is Alice's own handwriting. This is the blue prison note paper of Holloway Jail. The heading is Alice's own heading, heading itself. Some impressions of prison life. And the first sentence says, on being sentenced to 14 days in Westminster for asking for the rights of women. Alice goes on to read, uh, write about, to say about 800 words, and for the first time today, Mary's going to help me out by really adding just a very short extract of those notes. One in particular that I saw in church set me thinking, whatever could have brought her to prison. She was a girl not more than 16, with always such a sweet face and pathetic eyes. I could not keep my eyes off her every time we went to church. Many is the time my heart ached for the poor women that are in hard labour, for it is one long grind from early morning until late at night. That's right. But if the government of the day thought that 14 days in Holloway jail would dampen the women's spirits, they were badly mistaken. When I was first researching for this tour, I was looking through Alice's book of press cuttings, and I found a newspaper article from the Daily Sketch, printed the day after the women's release, in that February of 1907, and it describes perfectly the events of the day of the release. It describes how over th before dawn, over 300 women met outside the gates of, the ho of Holloway Jail. Being an occasion, they even hired a band to come along, the London Excelsior Band, that was playing stirring tunes, and the women in their cells could hear the band playing. And the article describes how at 9 o'clock in the morning, the gates of Holloway Jail opened, and the women came out one by one. As each one came out, they were cheered by the 300 strong. And once all out, they formed into a long line, marched in central London to a, what they called reformed breakfast meeting, with many notable figures of the day there to support them. Perhaps the reason that Alice cut the newspaper article out and put it in her fire register was the article mentions Alice. For at the end of the breakfast meeting, Alice stood up and read out a letter she'd received from her local MP while she was in jail. Now, if you remember, she'd written to him from the cells of Kenro Police Station, complaining of police brutality. Well, within a few days, and with the special permission of the governor of Holloway Jail, Alice got his reply, and he criticised her for her militancy. He said she was doing no good to the cause of women's rights. Pressed at the breakfast meeting for the name of her local MP in West Leicester in 1907, Alice said it was this fellow. Does anybody know? Come on. Good Scottish people who this chap is? <laughs> Those that don't? Anybody know? Ramsey MacDonald. Alice's local MP in West Leicester in 1907 was Ramsey MacDonald, the country's first Labour Prime Minister in 1929. And she knew him very well. MacDonald was a socialist. Alice was a socialist. They met at many meetings in, in Leicester. And she actually knew Probably Mrs. MacDonald, here's Mrs. MacDonald, and again these are Alice's own postcards. She knew Mrs. MacDonald even more because in 1906, Alice, Mrs. MacDonald, and others formed what they called the Women's Labour League, which was an attempt to keep women in the Labour Party rather than drifting out to the suffragette movement itself. Within a year, Alice had gone herself, but there we go. 
Ramsay MacDonald. But once out of this uh, prison, in March of 1907, held by Esmond Alfred, Alice organised a meeting in Leicester, invited uh, national leaders along, including Christopher Pankhurst, leader of the movement. And such was the success that night, the following month, in April 1907, Alice convened the inaugural meeting of the Leicester branch of the Women's Social and Political Union, the, local, the, suffragette, uh, the suffragette branch. So within the social history of Leicester, that's what Alice is renowned for, for forming the local branch of the suffragette movement. And here's Alice. Rather crinkly photograph of that, but there it is. And you see the sash, ladies and gentlemen? Again, we still have the sash in the family today. And the colours of that sash are, true as the, are as true as the day it was made a hundred years ago. Purple, white and green that stand for purity, hope and dignity. The summer of 1907 was to be a busy time for Alice. Alongside her trade union activities and socialism, she was now a suffragette. And she organised many local rallies. Many local rallies. And in the summer of 1907, and please remember this, I'm going to come back to it at the end of the talk. In the summer of 1907, she invited the Pankhurst sisters to come to Leicester as part of their national tour. So these very well-to-do ladies, Christabel and Sylvia Pankhurst, came to Leicester, rented rooms, stayed for about three weeks at Alice's own invitation. And again, I'll mention that at the end of the talk. And this is an event that Alice attended. Now let's go back to step. I've just mentioned Christabel and Sylvia Pankhurst coming to Leicester. Thirty years later, Sylvia Pankhurst was to write her autobiography in the 1930s. And she was to mention Alice. Mary's going to read out a short extract of Sylvia Pankhurst's autobiography. The election over, I moved to Leicester to work amongst the women in the shoemaking industry. Mrs. Hawkins, the WSPU secretary, was also active in the bootmakers' union. She introduced me to a small producer's cooperative factory, the Equity Shoes. At night I held meetings for the local WSPU women, amongst whom only Mrs. Hawkins as yet dared mount the platform. Thanks, Mark. For the other women, were actually in fear of losing their jobs if they stood up on a public platform and spoke out against their inequalities in life and their poor paying conditions. But the equity shoes, being a liberally minded employer, Alice had the freedom to speak. Moving on, June 1908, the, suffra the uh, National Suffragettes organised a meeting in Hyde Park. This is a photograph of Hyde Park, June 1908, called Women's Sunday. Half a million people attended, men and women, 80 speakers. Alice was noted in the Times for being one of those speakers. And this rather, must have tickled out this I would say, this, this rather amusing photograph is of uh, a General Flora Drummond, there she's standing on the top, hiring a barge, a Thames barge, there's the chap, actually he got him to hold up one of those banners, and they, and they moored that barge not 30 yards from the terraces of the House of Commons. So you can imagine the MPs coming out on a warm evening like, like today, perhaps a GT tea in one hand and an expense claim in the other. <laughs> the cabinet minister specially invited Hyde Park Sunday, June the 21st. There's one thing that unites MPs of England, Wales, and Scotland, and that's expense claims. <laughs> now let's look at some of the lovely photographs, uh, sorry, postcard photographs that are in the family collection. And there's probably 80 or 90 of these suffragette postcards. And it's worth remembering that if you were a public figure of the day, actor or actress, you would have your photograph taken and it was your calling card. Now that, what does that tell the family? Well these cards that Alice collected were actually the, people, the, the women that she worked with. They would give her a calling card. And in this particular case, one of the national leaders, here she is, a young woman in her twenties, Mary Gawthorpe, and she's actually signed it the 11th of June 1907. Just writes a few words on the back, it's a postcard back to Alice. Almost a short email of its day. And this is a beautiful postcard of a beautiful woman, Christabel Pankhurst, one of the leaders of the movement. And these postcards are 100 years old, but they are still in, fair, in quite good condition, actually. 
Uh, my mum, I mentioned to Mary yesterday, my mum, uh, who, who uh, was looking after these for many years, kept them in an old shoebox. And I remember as a teenager when mum would speak about her granny Alice and she'd go upstairs to try to find this shoebox with all this suffragette memorabilia, memorabilia in it and you'd hear them. The drawers banging upstairs and the door and mum would never quite remember where she left it all last. And if, if any student came knocking on the house door saying, well, they're studying the suffragette movement at school and couldn't run hell, she used to give them the shoebox and everything in it and off it would go. And hopefully a month or so later it would come back. There we go. Now you may wonder, ladies and gentlemen, why they included this postcard in the collection this afternoon. It's actually the, the Pankhurst family car. They were clearly well to do women. There's the chauffeur, there's Mrs. Pankhurst at the door. Well, the reason I've included it is it brings to mind a memory, uh, a recollection that I have of, of one of the, the uh, stories my grandfather told me when I was a young boy. He said often the Pankhurst would send up the family car to collect Alice to take her to a rally. Well, Alice and Alfred were poor working class people. They lived, lived in a rented terraced house in central Leicester. And my granddad said to me that apparently the chauffeur entering central Leicester, not quite knowing where their house was, would slowly drive along one street and then along another street and, 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 and along another street, not quite knowing where their house was. And apparently by the time he pulled the car up outside their house, there were hundreds of young men and women following the car, children snaking through the streets, this spectacle in 1907. And out Alice would come in her finery and off to London to speak. And this is the shop in central Leicester. The uh, suffragettes took a lease on the shop in 1909 with the profits going towards the suffragette cause. And I have to say, its windows were broken on regular occasions by men who believed that these women were really upsetting the status quo in society. And here's, my, here's Alice's husband, my great-grandfather, Alfred Hawkins. I mentioned earlier today, a few minutes ago, that Alfred supported his, his wife as a suffragette, as well as a socialist. Well, Alfred's time came in 1909, when a young cabinet minister by the name of Winston Churchill came up to Leicester to speak at an open rally, an open meeting. Churchill was to be the saviour of the nation later in life, but in 1909 he was an unpopular minister in an unpopular government. Churchill, for one, believed that uh, parliamentary time shouldn't be taken up with the issue of women in the boat. He felt there were far more important issues that should be debated in Parliament. So naturally, he was a target for the suffragettes. Well, if you can imagine the scene outside this uh, free trade hall that evening, Hundreds of people outside, waiting to go in, waiting to hear Churchill speak. Alice and four other suffragettes were there, ready to go in. The doors opened, and the women went to go in. They were refused entry by the stewards. Why, we don't quite know, but they obviously been identified. They were left out in the street. Alfred elected to go in on their behalf. Sitting at the back of the hall, choosing his moment with care, halfway through Churchill's speech, Alfred stood up and heckled Churchill on the issue of women's rights. How dare you stand on a democratic platform? What about the rights of women? There is the, they are his exact words. As soon as he interrupted Churchill, he was rushed by the stewards and pushed out the front doors, where he met up with his wife and the other women. All fired up, they tried to push their way past the stewards on the door to get back in to tell Churchill exactly what they thought of him. The police were called and all six were arrested. And so the next day, in the Leicester Magistrates Court, the women, and Alfred as well, were given the choice once again of paying a fine or going to Leicester jail. Alfred paid the fine. They had six children at <coughs> home that needed looking after. But the women, again, as was suffragette policy, refused to pay the fine, went to Leicester jail for 14 days. And here we have, slightly out of chronological order, the way they're explaining it today, a newspaper uh, snapshot, newspaper photographer taking a snapshot of Alice leaving the doors of the local magistrate's court in Leicester. This is a horse drawn Black Mariah police van. That's a plain clothes detective. There's a uniform dot. It almost seems a joyous occasion. The uniform dot's got a broad grin on his face. There we go. Alice is going off to Leicester jail. This is 1913. So she went to prison five times, ladies and gentlemen. She went to Holloway Jail twice and Leicester Jail three times. 
On this occasion, in 1913, and we may have some problems here today when I mention this, in 1913, she went to Leicester Jail for digging up golf courses in the dead of night. <laughs> Any golfers amongst you? No, but shouldn't you go up north to Trump's please? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. She went with other women to a local golf course, and with spades, dug the words, votes for women, out the cutting green. <laughs> and then, deciding that I wasn't quite enough for their night's nice work, they then built a bonfire and, and set that to light. And on another occasion, she went to jail in my hometown of Leicester for pouring Brunswick black printers in through the letterbox of the town hall. So when they opened the doors in the morning, this ink was all over the Italian marble floor. The following year, Alfred again was to Heckle Church, and this time he followed him up to Bradford, where uh, Alfred was, uh, sorry, I'll start again. He fo Alfred followed Churchill up to Bradford. Churchill was speaking in Bradford, St. George's or Bradford, by invitation from the Young Liberal Party in Bradford. Again, he heckled Churchill on the issue of women's rights. This time, the stewards were far more aggressive. It was on the first floor of the building. As soon as he interrupted Churchill, the stewards rushed in, picked him bodily up, stood at the top of the stone staircase and threw him down the stairs. He broke his leg and was in hospital for six weeks. One wet afternoon, Saturday afternoon, several years ago, I was Googling away, looking at this piece of my family history, and I put the young uh, liberals of Bradford in, Albert and Alfred Hawkins, and I found a letter that was lodged in the Churchill College, uh, Cambridge, one of the papers at Churchill College, Cambridge. I asked for a, paid my few pounds, I got a transcript, and it's a letter from the Bradford League of Young Liberals to Sir Winston Churchill. Here's a copy, I won't read it at all. The 15th day of February, 1911. Dear Sir, you will no doubt, you will doubtless remember addressing the demonstration at St George's Hall, Bradford on November the 26th last, when your speech was frequently interrupted by male sympathisers. We have reason to believe that the opposition at the meeting was a work of an organised gang of members of the union, that's the men's political union, which was affiliated to the suffragettes. And unfortunately, a Mr Alfred Hawkins of Leicester was injured in the course of ejection. I'll just to find the spot here. It goes on to mention that uh, the Men's Political Union had formed a fighting fund on Alfred's behalf and sued the Young Liberals of Bradford in a civil court for damages. And, and, the, and they say to Church at this point that we, we have taken counsel's opinion and believe they have no case to prove. <clears throat> well, they were wrong. Before a Lord Justice Avery and a civil jury of men, 12 men, Alfred was awarded £100 in damages. And this is a leaflet printed by the Men's Political Union in 1911, advertising the event, saying that he was awarded £100 for his forcible ejection from a meeting at St George's or Bradford, addressed by the right hon. Winston Churchill MP. Well, again, when I was researching this part of my family history about seven years ago, I went to see, went to see my mum's cousin, Madge, 88 years of age, a grand, both, all, both granddaughters of Alice. And I said to Madge, a hundred pounds match, a hundred years ago, that was a tremendous amount of money. Whatever did Alfred do with it? She said, he drank it. <laughs> there we go. What he actually did, he actually bought what you call an, well, I call it an off-license, what you call it in Scotland. Okay. Yeah, an off-license with it, but he wasn't, he was his biggest customer. <laughs> Didn't last long. November 1910, in fact, there was a... It was a day of protest on a Friday in November 1910, and it was called Black November. The St. Henry just passed it a couple of years ago, of course. Earlier in the year, the government had led the, uh, led the suffragettes to believe that a bill would go through Parliament that would finally give women the right to vote. But they had an ulterior motive. It was the year of the uh, coronation of the king. I believe I'm right to say that. And the word on the streets were the suffragettes were likely to disrupt the coronation march itself. And also, there were under increasing pressure from all sides of the house on the issue of women's rights. 
Well, the suffragettes, believing that the bill uh, would go through, eased off on their militancy, their militant activities. And in fact, on his first reading, a bill was passed to give women the vote. But in November 1910, on his second reading, the bill was unanimously rejected in Parliament. And the women realised, the suffragettes realised they'd been had. So they took to the streets of London to protest on several dates in 1910. Unfortunately, for reasons never ever explained, Churchill, as Home Secretary, instead of calling in the Central London Police to deal with these marches, called in the East End Police, who had no experience of dealing with the women's marches. And the East End Police beat the women up, and they beat them up quite savagely. And Alice, standing in full view of a police officer, picked up the grip and threw it through one of the last remaining panes of window and broke it in the Home Office, 14 days in Holloway Jail. While she's in Holloway Jail, she writes to her husband Alfred, who, who is now actually still in hospital in Bradford. So Alice is in prison, Alfred's in hospital. Alice writes to Alfred. We went in a body, about 300 of us, to Downing Street to tell him, as with, what we thought about it. Of course, we were met by a large body of police, and I can tell you it was awful. The police were simply horrid and they banged and fought like a lot of tigers at times. After a large number of arrests, they eventually got us out of the street into Whitehall. After about half an hour, I was simply done up and made up my mind to go do something else. When a number of women went out to break cabinet ministers' windows, I volunteered to lead 12 to Mr. Harcourt's house. It was easier to break windows than to have my body broken. Here's a photograph of the Leicester women forming up just outside the shop I showed you in the previous image. There they are, there's Alice just at the back there on the left. And the lovely silk banner, if you ever see a photograph of the, of the suffragette marching particularly through London, every city branch will go through with these large silk banners, 14 feet high, bamboo poles, silk banners, guide ropes at every corner. And this banner, the Leicester women actually made themselves, they formed a sewing circle, sewed the banner themselves. And the motto, the motto of the Leicester women, which is on the banner, you can't quite see, always and always facing towards the light. And I think they're very true words. Now let's look, let's look some more at some of the lovely photographs, at some of the lovely postcards that we have in the family collection, Mara. Have you been ready at one o'clock? Sorry, we've just... Oh, we've <laughs> Here, I'm sorry, that's my fault. Here we have, it, now this must have tickled Alice because she was a very keen cyclist. <coughs> Cycling and suffragettes actually went together. She cycled for hundreds of miles campaigning. The cycle provided that means of transport. But here we have the man doing a wa the washing in a wooden dolly. And the woman's going out on her bike for the morning, the new woman. Have dinner ready at one o'clock, John. There we go. A very forward postcard, you may think, ladies and gentlemen, for a hundred years ago. Perhaps some of you may think very forward for today as well. How many of you ladies say, I'm going out and have my dinner ready at one o'clock? <laughs> I was lucky enough to be on the uh, BBC Antiques Roadshow uh, about five years ago in a special episode. We, my sister Sue and I went up to Rotherham just to an evaluation day with this memorabilia. Uh, we were, I was um, recorded in the afternoon, picked out in the crowd, recorded in the afternoon. And they, but what they actually did, they actually showed it in a special what called compilation episode uh, called, National, called National Archives Special, where they took <coughs> pieces of what they call national interest from that one series and put them into a special episode. And as I say, I was recorded in the afternoon with a young uh, valuable called Catherine who's still on the show. And as we talked, about all the postcards set out and other memorabilia on the table. And during the recording, Catherine said, do you have a favourite postcard, Peter? And I said, actually, Catherine, I said, I do. I said, it's the polling booth. Here we have the school teacher, the pillar of society educating the nation's children, and the common criminal in his prison guard. But what makes it my favourite is the poem, Companions in Disgrace. And she actually asked me to read it out as the cameras were rolling. And they left that after final editing. They left that in the programme. But today, Mary's going to read out Companions in Disgrace. Convicts and women kindly know they are not allowed to have the vote. The difference between the two I will now indicate to you. When once the harmful man of crime in Wormwood Scrubs has done his time, he at the Pope can have his say. 
the harmless women never made. To me, that sums up the injustice of the day. That the school teacher, the female school teacher, the pillar of society educating the nation's children never acquires the right to vote. And why is that? Well, she's a woman. And yet the convict loses his voting rights when he goes into jail, but reacquires them when he comes out. And why is that? Well, of course, he's a man, isn't he? Sums up the injustice of the day. I had some lovely letters from viewers following the uh, following that to this. <coughs> Have you a vote, Mr. Brown? Of course, I got a vote, which I'll have so long as my wife takes in washing. <laughs> now, this is another favourite postcard of mine. It's not what's on the front, it's actually a Christmas card. But it's what's on the back. It's actually a postcard from a fellow suffragette to Alice, December the 22nd, 1911. Right. Dear Mrs. Hawkins, I hope you're quite well after your holiday at Holloway Castle. <laughs> My husband's just got two months hard labour for breaking the Home Office window as a protest against Mr. McDougall's sentence last Monday. Hoping you'll have a happy Christmas and a good New Year. Yours truly, Jeannie Bale. There we go. It's a lovely piece of social and political history. It just sums everything up for me. Now we come to January 1913. And that's just six months away from his centenary date next year. Flora Drummond, Drummond, General Drummond, who organised, who was on the top of the Thames Barge, organised uh, 300 working women to go down to London to put their point of view over to Lloyd George. Now, Flora Drummond organised the Suffragette March in 1909, just out here in Princess Street. She organised that march in 1909. And several years later, in 1913, she organised 300 women, as I say, to go to London to meet Lloyd George. And from Alice's own book of press cuttings, I found these newspapers, there we go, the Daily Sketch, Friday, January the 24th, 1913, we have a photograph of the fisherwives of New Haven, here in Edinburgh, ready to leave Edinburgh to go down to London as part of that deputation. And we have a link with Alice. You see that lady there, there she is? Well, there she is there, and there's Alice. Standing on the steps of the House of Parliament, waiting to go in to speak to Lloyd George. And this is another press cutting, again with the Fisher Wives of New Haven, and again with Alice. So there's the women, and there's Alice, waiting to go in. 300 women went into that meeting with Lloyd George, and there were 28 speakers there that day. Alice was one of the speakers. And Alice said to Lloyd, stood up and said to Lloyd George that here she was, a woman in society who brought two uh, sons into this world who were already serving the country. My grandfather was in the Navy in 1912. His brother was in the Army. She brought those sons into this world, yet she didn't have the rights that they had. She didn't have the vote. And that couldn't be right. She stood up and told Lloyd George point blank. However, by the end of the day, Lloyd George had listened, but rejected any, uh, gave no opportunity to them uh, that, that the, the issue of women to vote for progress in Parliament. So that night, all of the women took to the streets of London to protest, and the windows down Oxford Street were broken, virtually all of them. It was militancy. Let's move back a bit, sorry. Later in 1913, the Leicester women decided to step the militant activities up a gear and went up into North Leicestershire in the dead of night and tried to set fire to a public building. Couldn't get it to go. They went to down to a public building in South Leicestershire in the dead of night, tried to set fire to that. Couldn't get that to go either. So they finally had a go at a place called Stoughton Hall near central Leicester. Again, they couldn't get it to, to ignite. So they sent a telegram to the National Office in London. Could they please send the lady up to Leicester to show her how to commit arson? <laughs> and sure enough, this suffragette, this hot blood suffragette, they were called the more militant suffragettes, a West End stage actress called Kitty Marion, came up to Leicester, showed her how to take uh, large poles, uh, bed linen, and tar, and do the job. And just a few weeks later, a lovely uh, wooden Victorian railway building was burnt to the ground on the outskirts of Leicester. The Leicester police 
knew it was the suffragettes, and they thought it was one in particular, a woman called Ellen Sherriff. But about 40 years ago, my grandfather once was whispered to my mum, it was never Ellen that did it, it was Alice. We'll never know. But I skipped a beat, because sadly in 1912, one of Alice and Alfred's six sons died of blood poisoning. This is the day, this is, these are the times we call modern drugs. And young Tom pretty his thumb whilst he was at work in an engineering factory. Within a few days he died. Sylvia Pankhurst wrote a moving letter of condolence to Alice and Alfred. My heart is full of deep sympathy for you, Mrs. Hawkins, in this great trouble that has come to you. It is indeed a great blow to bear. May you find courage and consolation in the knowledge you have of your son's beautiful and noble character. We think of you and all that you and Mr. Hawkins have done for our cause, and we hope that time, the great healer, will soften your great sorrow. There we go. Moving words from Sylvia Pankhurst. Well, in 1914, the Great War breaks out, and telegrams go from the National Office in London to all the branches throughout the land, asking them to cease their, mil cease their militancy and support the nation in its time of need. So Alice's time as a suffragette came from the abrupt end. This is a photograph of my grandfather who was in the army at this point, having left the Navy, he's now in the Royal War Scars. Young man. I remember as a young boy in the, uh, the mid-60s, sitting with my grandfather during the school holidays. And my grandfather used to tell me how he used to argue with his mother Alice over how women finally got the vote. Because my grandfather believed throughout his life, and he told me this, and remember he'd been on the suffragette rallies in Leicester himself, but grandfather believed it was the role of the women in the First World War that got them the vote. By going into the factories, onto the land, replacing the men who went to the front to fight. That finally convinced the government of the day to give women their rights in society. But he said his mother Alice never did agree with this. She believed it was the pressure brought to bear by the suffragettes that finally got women the vote. Limited vote in 1918, full vote in 1928. And as I say, my grandfather said to me, him and his mother never ever did agree which was which. Well, we're moving on now. Mum sadly died this year at the age of 88. But um, some five or six years ago, we had to clear her house out as she was moving into a care home as she got dementia. The awful thing is she lost the memories of her, of her granny Alice, amongst other things. But we had this we had this task, my sisters and I, which everybody will have at some point perhaps, of clearing a house out, and she had hundreds of photographs. I mean, you never write on the back of photographs where they were taken, who they were with. You look at them ten years later, or somebody else looks at them, and you... And of course you... But I have to say, luckily, I found this photograph, this family photograph, taken about 1938, outside my grandfather's council house. I mean, you call it social housing now, I call it a council house. There's his house, there's my grandfather, man in his mid-fifties, as I am today. There's Alice. Alfred's now dying. Alice is living with her son. And there's my mum, who's 15, about 15 years of age. And the baby uh, was not until my aunt was taking the photograph. So, of all, these, of, all, of all these hundreds of photographs, I felt quite lucky and honoured to find this one. My mum and Alice and my grandfather all together. And this is the front page of the local newspaper, the Leicester Evening Mail, which I have at home, the full copy, March the 12th, 1946, City Suffragette dead, jailed five times in the fight for women's vote. She actually died at my grandfather's house at the age of 83. Now, for a woman born in mid-Victorian mid times, that actually wasn't bad go. 83 today would be 100, 60 years old. And all but the last few weeks, Alice was still campaigning. In fact, she campaigned. She did what she could in the, in the Labour uh, in the general elections of 1945. She was down in the Labour Hall in Leicester, putting leaflets in envelopes, apparently doing what she could for the Labour Party right up until those last few weeks. So, how would I sum up my great grandmother Alice? Well, I said she was a determined woman. She was a radical, and she was militant. But she stood up for what she believed in in life. That's human. And she had the full support of her family and also of her employer, the equity shoes. Well, since that time, ladies and gentlemen, Alice has become part of the social history of Leicester. Um, and from time to time, the local newspaper, which is called the Leicester Mercury, 
If they do anything on times gone by, they may well mention the suffragettes. So we often used to see artists' name mentioned in these articles of times gone by. But about eight years ago, an article appeared to say that the Leicester City Museum Service had successfully been at, Southern, uh, no, successfully been at Christie's for a pastel sketch drawn by Sylvia Pankhurst in 1907. Apparently paid £10,000 for this sketch. And it goes on to say that the sketch was drawn by Sylvia Pankhurst while she was visiting the workers of the Equity Shoe Factory in Leicester, and it was believed to be of Leicester's suffragette, Mrs. Alice Hawkins. Here it is. If you remember, Alice invited the Pankhurst sisters to come to Leicester as part of their tour around uh, England, and it gave the Pankhurst sisters the chance to meet working women in society. Well, Sylvia Pankhurst was an artist by trade, so we can only imagine that sometime during those few weeks in Leicester in the summer of 1907, Sylvia Pankhurst had gone to the shoe factory with her sketch and, and crayons and sketched Alice while she was at work. She's actually sitting at her shoe bench performing a shoe operation called Skyling, where they braise the upper and lower parts of the shoe together and then they either glue it or nail it together. Skyling. It's not what young students do on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Well, we never knew the sketch existed, so it came as a tremendous surprise, pleasant surprise to us. I contacted the local newspaper, they came round, did an article on my mum and her memories of her Granny Alice. And just a few weeks later, my mum called me and she said, Pete, she said, I've had a, an invitation from the museum service to the unveiling of the sketch. Would you take, would you and Sue take me along? So my sister Sue and I took my mum along one afternoon, not quite knowing what to expect, went into a, quite a large room in this lovely Georgian building, the museum itself in central Leicester. About 70 people there. Lots of, do you have any councillors of any type here today? No? Yes? Oh. Some of the earth. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, all rather full of themselves, regardless of their politics. But my mum, my mum was treated, I think a piece of family history, my mum was treated as, as the VIP that day because she, she was the living link to Alice Hawkins' suffragette. And with just a few minutes to go, the director of the museum, Sarah Levitt, came over to my mum and she said, <coughs> she said, come on then Vera, she said, we want, you to, we want you to unveil the sketch. And that's what my mum did, unveil the sketch. But one rather amusing incident happened just before that. Mum was looking at the sketch and she was looking rather puzzled. And I said, I'm from Leicester. I said, what's wrong, ma'am? She said, I don't think it's Alice. <laughs> <laughs> that's not her hair, I don't think that's my grandmother. <laughs> Oh dear, what should we do now? <laughs> and Sarah Levitt, the director, came and said, What's wrong, Vera? She said, well, I don't think it's Alice. <laughs> she said, Never mind, Vera, we won't school the party, will we? <laughs> <laughs> so one went on to unveil the sketch. It's now in the Social History Museum in Leicester. Well, there's one more, as we nearly close now. Until two years ago, the factory in Leicester where Alice once worked all those years ago was still in operation. But sadly, two years ago, it went into liquidation after 120 years as a, as a workers' cooperative, and it still was when it went down. But when I first got this talk together some six or seven years ago, I actually was invited down by the managers of the company, and this is the actual factory itself in central Leicester where Alice worked all those years ago. There's some of these cornucopia, cornucopia, overly. Uh, and you can see the scales here, which I think are the scales of social justice, being a workers' cooperative. And you may wonder, ladies and gentlemen, why I included this in the uh, presentation this afternoon. This photograph I took on the first floor of the factory building itself. It's the very spot where the sketch was drawn all those years ago. If you see the metal window frames and the brick pillow, See the metal in the front of the brick pillar? Sorry. I have to say, when the factory manager took me to that spot and said this is where the sketch was drawn, it was a moving moment for me. And you know, perhaps you've all seen the BBC series, who do you think you are when you get that defining moment? Or whoever's on gets that defining moment. And to think this is where Alice was working a hundred years ago at a workbench. Now, you know, it's... What can I say? And here's my mum, who was in better health then. I invited my mum down to the factory in the afternoon for a look round where her granny Alice used to work. 
And you can see a blue plaque on the wall, ladies and gentlemen. And here it is. City of Leicester, Alice Hawkins, 1863 to 1946. Leader of the women's suffrage movement in Leicester. Worked for many years with equity shoes. Well, for my final slide this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, it's of the abiding memories that my mum had of her granny palace. I used to sit down with my mum and I'd say to her, come on mum, what do you remember about Alice? And she used to say, oh I don't know now, it's, it's a long time ago, I really can't remember. But after a few moments, my mum's eyes would always light up and she'd always say the same thing to me. She said, when I was a young girl, my granny Alice said to me, Vera, she said, you must use your vote, we suffered for it. And my mum said that she always voted. She said that Granny would turn in a grave if she didn't. Well, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Alice Hawkins, a suffragette in the family. I hope you enjoyed the talk this afternoon. But I'm going to ask Mary to help me one last time by finishing my talk the way I believe my great grandmother Alice would have finished her public speaking a hundred years ago. Let the clarion call go out. Thoughts for women. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we need some audience participation, don't we? <laughs> so come on, let's do that again and everybody join in. Come on, let the clarion call go out. Well, oh, that's so there we go. Uh, I noticed the man here rather begrudgingly just saying that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, before I take questions, I've got a few handouts. I've got a, I'll leave a, no, I'll leave that here actually. Uh, there's three of them. One is the front page of my website, which is an educational website. It's all about Alice, www.alicesuffragette.com. It's for students of the movement. Uh, there's some lovely audio on there. Listen for the song, Nana Was a Suffragette. Have a look at the documentary that uh, a charity helped, uh, I can't, I helped with. Um, I have a magazine article, which appeared several years ago in Family History magazine. I'll take a copy home. And just uh, in April this year, The Guardian uh, printed a, uh, an article of mine in the Saturday supplement about my granny Alice. So please take a free copy of that. Are there any questions? I've got one, straight off the bat. Is there more work to do? Um, well, it's such a rich mine of information. There's so much more I could have said about Alice, which clearly is not appropriate in the space of a 40 minute talk. And, it's, it's so rich and the website, I think, is my centre of uh, attention at the moment because you've only seen all the website will only have a fraction of the memorabilia on it. And I want to keep uploading more and more. I, use, uh, I pay a young university guy who's just finished university to, to help him with the website. And I've, I'm trying to concentrate on the website because it's reaching a far wider audience, isn't it? You know, it's reached a far wider audience. And I think it's quite important that that young people in society today remember what those women had to do. Well, I, I was thinking in terms of, uh, I mean, there, there's not equality in terms of pay and lots of other issues. I was uh, listening to Professor Pat Thane do some really interesting talks on uh, talking on inequality. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I, do, do you think that this idea of Equality that has been lost somewhat. Yeah, here, here's the vote now. Yeah, know, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, ages. I'm not suggesting for one moment that you know the women got the vote and that was the end of the issue. It's not. It was just the start of the end, hopefully. And I think there's still a lot more work to do. I think the story of Alice, though, reaches out to people on several levels. It's not just a piece of uh, history. I think it's a, a, almost a moral tale of, of women overcoming adversity. She might have been poor, she might have worked long hours in a shoe factory, you know, but she held, held, her, held, held, her, held her head up high and stood up for what she believed in, and I think that's, that's the moral tale of today. Any other questions? Was she, did your mum never tell you, was she much of a talk, was she a storyteller, Alice? Was she, did she no, say my mum, well, actually, that's a good question. My mum said she was actually quite frightened of her granny Alice. <laughs> um, she, what did she say to me? She said she re well, she was a bit. She wasn't the cuddly grandmother of today. She was a Victorian lady, and my mum remembers that when she was about five, she was standing next to her mother, and Alice was standing next to them. And Alice had this large brimmed hat, and she peered down at my mum, who was a little five-year-old. And mum said she had to go and hid in her um, the pleats of her mother's skirt. 
But she also told me that if ever there was an argument in the family or something that, you know, wanted to be strongly debated, Alice would never back down. She would always argue in her corner. And that's the woman she was. She was into, I mean, her other sisters were not radical, but Alice was, you know, she was one of them all. Any other questions? Right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you mentioned that she was one of nine children and they did seem to survive pretty much into adulthood, but then you only talk about two sons. So she had a much, she had a really small family for Alice. somebody of that period. No, Alice had six. Oh, she had six. Uh, sorry, four sons and two daughters. One, Tom died uh -huh. early on, which we've mentioned. Uh, but um, my grandfather and his brothers all fought in the First World War and all survived. Mm. So, yeah, I didn't do too badly actually. I'm still finding, I'm still picking up uh, distant relatives. <laughs> they, they seem to find, well now we've got the website, they seem to pick me up, so it's, it's good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah? So, I'd just like to say a special thanks to Marion, who's helped me out so well. So. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. This is Ragged University. It's people sharing what they are passionate about, uh, what they've invested their lives in. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along and cheering during these talks. But I'd like to also thank the libraries and a special thanks to to Joe and Tommy and Hilary uh, and and to Ian who support behind the scenes so that yes. Month in, month out, there, there are events that we can all come together around. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks very much. And here you'll see these cards laid around. You might think, how can you support this? Very simple. Go on Facebook, if you do Facebook, and press the like button. Uh, or follow on the Twitter. Or if you want to do a talk and share something that you, you want to get out there. Uh, Criticize the website? Great. Um, want more people involved? Uh, the next talk is on the 6th of September. It's on the website. We've got Tracy Griffin. She's going to tell us all about how to do healthy living in Edinburgh. And we've got Damien Natkamp, who's going to be talking about uh, eco skets and, and going through the, the, the points one by one. So thanks very much for coming. Please help eat all of this and have a lovely Thank you.